ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى نبينا صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اخرج الامام مسلم عن سليم الدهري رضي الله عنه ان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الدين النصيحه الدين النصيحه الدين النصيحه قلنا لما يا رسول الله قال لله ولكتابه ولرسوله ولائمه المسلمين وعمتهم الامام مسلم has collected the hadith on the authority of the companion Tamim al-Dari Al-Imam Muslim brought the hadith of the companion Tamim al-Dari and Tamim al-Dari was a companion who used to be from the Nasara and embraced al-Islam and he has a number of fadail and from his fadail is that he was shipwrecked and in the process of trying to get back to al-Madina he had an opportunity to meet the Daba one of the Ashrat al-Kubra one of the big signs of the Awa he said that he heard the Prophet say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam الدين النصيحة الدين النصيحة الدين النصيحة he said three times the religion is giving good advice the religion is giving good advice the religion is giving good advice the companions upon hearing that as was their case whenever they used to hear things from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they would want further clarification and elaboration they took the time out to learn about their religion They were a group of people who would hear his instruction, who would hear something that he had to say and not pay any attention to it. Today, if a person goes and he makes Salat, Salat al-Jum'ah, he goes into the khutbah. When he comes out of the khutbah, if you ask 10 minutes, 15 minutes after the khutbah, what was the subject matter of the khutbah? The person will say, Allah, I don't know, I don't remember. So they want a further clarification and they ask, the question Ya Rasulullah the religion is given nasiha to who? he said the religion is given nasiha to Allah and to the book of Allah and to the messenger of Allah and to the leaders of the Muslims as well as the general Muslim public in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam we see the importance of al-nasiha in the everyday life and the deen of all of us as Muslims and it also shows the importance and the significance of a nasiha and that there is no one sitting here in this audience except that he is a person who is in need of advice everyone here is in need of being advised and he also is in a situation where he has to advise others and he cannot be afraid of advising others and he can't take it for granted that someone knows nor can he be prevented from advising as a result of the fear of that individual he may think that if he advises that individual he's going to reject his advice or he may think that that person is beyond being advised the prophet used to tell the companion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told us as well لا تمنع أن أهدكم هيبة الناس أو هيبة الرجل أن يقول الحق 
إذا شهده أو إذا علمه. Do not let the fear of any group of people. Don't allow the fear of any person. Do not let it prevent you from saying the truth if you witness the truth or if you know the truth. So someone may be older, someone may be a scholar, you may think, someone, whatever reason you may say, I, I'm not going to advise him because he's going to reject the Nasiha or he must already know or whatever the reason. Everyone here is in need of Masiha and everyone here is in a position where he should be given Masiha. So this hadith shows the importance of and Nasiha and the Deen of Al Islam. That it is a basic fundamental aspect of the Islam of every Muslim. From how we understand the importance of Al Nasiha in this hadith is number one, the Prophet who says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a Deen al Nasiha three times. Whenever you read an ayat in the Quran being mentioned over and over again, it is not because Allah wants to waste time. When the Prophet says something, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, multiple times, it is not because he wants to waste time. One of the hikmas behind that is that he wants to emphasize that. So, inna ma'al usri usra, inna ma'al usri usra. Allah could have just said one time, verily with difficulty there was ease, but he mentioned it again. So that the person who has some difficulty, he is in no doubt. Allah mentioned it at least twice in the same ayah. Don't give up hope. The difficulty that you have is ease. Don't be in doubt. And it's mentioned again. So in this hadith, he mentioned the issue three times. It's the dalil of the importance of a nasiha. If you're in doubt, he mentioned it three times. In addition to that, what proves the importance of a nasiha in the deen is that he said, a deen in nasiha. A deen in nasiha. He made the whole religion of al Islam give him nasiha. In the hadith of Umar Rabbi Allah Anhu, when Jibreel came and he asked, What is Islam? What is Al Iman? What is Al Ihsan? Rasulullah answered the question. And then Jibreel got up and he left. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Umar, a Tidri Manasai, we call Allah wa Rasulullah Anhu. Umar, do you know who the questioner was? Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, Inna hu Jibreel, Asa yu alimakum deenakum. That was Jibril. He came to teach you your deen. So he described everything that was taught to him on that day as being the deen. A deen in Nasiha. All of Islam is a Nasiha. All of Al Iman, the Arkan of Sitt of Al Iman, is a Nasiha. Al Ihsan, to worship Allah as if you see him, and even though you don't see him, he sees you, is a Nasiha. The whole deen. So it shows again the importance of a Nasiha. If anyone is in doubt as to the reality of Nasiha in our lives as Muslim, the companion Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, Rabbi Allahu Anhu, he said in an authentic hadith that is Muttafaqun alayhi, Bayatu al-Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala iqam al-salah, wa ita al-zakat, wa al-nushi bi kulli Muslim. He said, I gave Rasulullah the bay'ah. When I embraced Islam, I embraced Islam and the bay'ah that I gave him and that he took from me is that I would establish the salah, a rukun from the arkan of Islam. And that I would give the zakat, a rukun from the arkan of Islam. And that I would advise every single Muslim. So he never would take the bay'ah except on issues that were avima. He takes the bay'ah that you don't make shirk with Allah. He takes the bear that you do not kill your children. He takes the bear that you do not make false accusations. And in addition to taking the bear, the Arabs had the practice of shaping, shaking the hands to further strengthen and emphasize the issue of the bear. So he used to take the bear from people that they would give a nasiha. So the nasiha, Ikhwan, in the deen of al Islam for all of us. Everyone here is in need of Nasiha and everyone here is in a position where he is called on to advise those who are around him because the nature of the human being, everyone, the nature of the human being is that everyone has blind spots. No one has the ability to see all around him. No one has the ability to know everything connected to his own affairs. He's driving the car and he's backing up 
out of the parking lot. He has to rely on the passenger in the passenger seat, whether it's on the side of him or on the back. Can I continue to back up? Is a car coming? How close am I to the garbage can and so forth and so on? He has to rely on other people because, as it was mentioned in so many of the classes already in the Durus of Al Aqidah, the Durus where the focus is on Al Tawheed, Antum al Fuqara'u ila Allah. We are poor and we are in need and we are deficient. As for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is Ghani and He's the only one who is not in need. So we all need Nasiha and we all have to give a Nasiha. Allah is the only one who does not need Nasiha. He is the only one. So with that being the case, I wanted to explain this hadith to you, the importance of a Nasiha in the religion of Al-Islam. And the one who is consistently rejecting the advice of the people, that one is on a dangerous way of Al-Islam. That is the way of the Mutakabbirin. The one who doesn't accept Nasiha, or the one who believes, I can live in this life and I don't need to hear what people have to say. Some people, they feel and they think, I don't need anyone. No, everyone needs each other. Everyone needs somebody. Why? Ad-Dinu Nasiha, Ad-Dinu Nasiha, Ad-Dinu Nasiha. As it relates to this issue, they ask them, Ad-Dinu Nasiha to who, Rasulullah? He said, the deen is giving nasiha to Allah. The religion is giving nasiha to Allah. Now, Ikhwan, as I mentioned, Allah Ta'ala is ghaneen ala al-alameen. His knowledge comprehends and extends beyond everything. If someone sat there and they thought that they are in a position to say, Oh Allah, I advise you, guide Fulan, and don't guide Fulan. Oh Allah, I advise you, make Fulan rich and make Fulan poor. Oh Allah, I'm advising you, guide my mother to Al-Islam. If a person thought that that was possible, if a Muslim thought that that was possible, he needs to understand that that is kufr. And I don't believe that there's a Muslim in the dunya, the one who's living all the way in the desert. He can't read, he can't write, but he's on the fitra. No Muslim thinks that Allah can be advised. So what is the meaning of a deen nasiha for Allah and to Allah? What is the meaning of that? It goes to show Ikhwan the importance of the Arabic language and the need that we all have to come to know the Arabic language and to know when the religion is requiring us to understand something linguistically and when it's requiring us to understand a technical aspect of the, of the language or of the deen. And Nasiha Ikhwan in the Arabs it can be understood, the meaning of it, from an ayah in Surah Al-Tawbah, ayah number 91, Allah Ta'ala, He said, لَيْسَ عَلَى الدُّعَفَاءِ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرْضَاءِ وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ حَرَجٌ إِذَا نَسَحُوا لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Pay attention, ayah number 39, Surah Al-Tawbah, the meaning of nasiha in the religion. Allah said, there is no harm. There is no blame on those who are weak, the du'afa, they're sick, they're weak. No blame on the one who is sick. No blame on the one who is extremely poor. There is no blame on them if they do not go out to make the jihad. With the condition that they nasahu lillahi wa rasulihi. With the condition that they have nasiha for Allah and His Messenger. And nasiha means al-ikhlas. The one who is da'if, he's very old, he's very young, he can't make jihad because of his da'af, or he's sick. The individual may suffer from paralysis, the individual, he may have one leg, the individual has a sickness that doesn't allow him to participate in the jihad. Or he's extremely poor. His accompanying the mujahideen is going to be a fitna. He doesn't have any weapon, he doesn't have a horse, he's just a body taking up space. There's no haraj, no blame if he doesn't go out for the jihad, as long as he has a khlas. It was the characteristic of the munafiqeen 
to not go out for the jihad. They will remain in Medina. And when they remain behind, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions were out fighting, the Munafiqeen would say, I hope the family of so-and-so gets killed in the jihad because if he doesn't come back, I'm going to marry his wife and take his money. Another Munafiq will say, I hope Muhammad is killed in that jihad because if he doesn't come back, I'll be the leader of the people in Medina. Another one will say, if they get killed, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We're going to expel the Muslims. And if the Muslims won the war, they will have shamata. Shamata. Another one of those Arabic words that we should add on to our dictionary. A shamata is a characteristic of the evil people. Those people who, if good befalls the Muslims, they hate it. But if evil befalls them, they become happy. Somebody has an enemy, he doesn't like that individual. Maybe he's Muslim in Al-Islam. They are people who go overboard in Islam. We have the fitna of the ghulats on our dawah. We have the fitna of the ghulats. Something happens to one of them. You cannot have shamata for a Muslim. That is a, a characteristic of the munafiqeen. If he gets divorced, you're happy. If his child dies, you're happy. To hear he got fired from his job, you're happy. To hear that he lost his money, the investment, you're happy. That's the characteristic of the munafiqeen. On the other hand, the Muslim who didn't participate in the jihad, the real companions, they used to take care of the families of the mujahideen. They used to make dua in the absence of the mujahideen. They used to do their best to protect Medina. So Allah is mess in this particular ayah, ikhwan, he explains, those who don't make jihad, if you have a bad excuse, you're not blameworthy if you have nasiha to Allah and His Messenger. If you have ikhlas. So that's the meaning of a nasiha. A deen al nasiha lillah, it means having ikhlas to Allah. Not making shirk in your ibadah to Allah. Don't make the shirk al akbar or the shirk al asghar. Al ikhlas to Allah is believing in Him the way He wants you to believe in Him. In His asma and His sifat. What he established for himself, we establish for him without explaining it away, without denying it. If Allah Ta'ala has established that he is over his arsh, and Masiha Allah is for you to come and say, I believe that, in a way that is befitting Allah's majesty, he lies, he comes down, he has a foot, he has a hand, and so forth and so on. All of that is al-ikhlas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not making shit with him. That's the mean of al-nasiha. The Arabs used to say nasahtu al-asl. I made nasiha to the honey. Meaning I separated the pollutants from the honey from that part of the honey that you eat. Throw away the wax. Throw away all of that stuff that the people don't eat. That's al-nasiha. So we have to know the language. When Umar radiallahu anhu in the month of Ramadan saw that the people were mutafarriqeen in the salah of Taraweeh and he put them behind three imams, united the Muslims, and he said, Ni'mat bid'a hadihi. This is a good bid'a. Was Umar talking about the religious concept and idea of al bidah so someone can come and understand and say, La, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, the one who was from the Khulafa al-Rashidin, he even said that there's a good bidah, a bidah hasana. He was talking about the linguistic meaning of al bidah not the religious meaning of al bidah So when Nasiha ikhwani in the deen, in the language, as it relates to Allah, it means having ikhlas, not making shirk. And nasiha to the book of Allah is also being sincere to the book of Allah. And how are we sincere to the book of Allah? We are sincere to the book of Allah in that we find it an obligation to acquaint ourselves consistently with reading the Qur'an. Learning how to read it correctly is an obligation. In our masjid right now, I see some brothers who are Arabs. 
If there was an Arab right here who had a PhD in Arabic language, Wallahi, Summa Billahi, that individual cannot come and pick up the Quran and read it correctly without a Muallam. He can't do it. Kana Jibreel, Radi Allahu Alma. Jibreel used to come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and rehearse the Quran with him. Taught him how to read the Quran correctly. Prevented him from reading the Quran and moving his lips very fast. In the month of Ramadan, he used to read the Quran with him every Ramadan. In the year that he died, he went over the Quran with him two times. And the Prophet is the Afsah al Arab. He was the most eloquent of all of the Arabs. What he said in Arabic language is the measurement. It is what we judge the Arabic language on and with. And yet, Jibreel used to teach him the Quran. So you cannot pick up that Quran and just read it correctly. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, وَرَتِّلْ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا He ordered, read the Quran with tartil. Read the Quran with tajweed. Stop where you're supposed to stop. Make the correct pronunciations and so forth and so on. And it's no wonder that we find in the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu that's been collected by Imam al-Bukhari that he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa'allama The best of the people who are sitting here in this majlis you want to know who's the best? That individual can be a sister can be the young one from amongst us it can be an ajami the best of you is the one who learns the Qur'an and he teaches it to others. He learns how to read the Qur'an properly and then he teaches it to others. So a nasiha to the Book of Allah is not doing what is a common practice of the Muslims, what we grew up with, those of us who are born and raised on this deen, of getting a nice cover to put the Qur'an in closing the cover and putting it on the highest shelf of the house but it's collecting dust on the highest shelf of the house we never read the Quran or we wait till the month of Ramadan to read and to complete the Quran I say unto you, Ikhwani the vast majority of people who wait until Ramadan to read the Quran the secret behind why you never complete it is the Quran is not that type of book it is not the type of book that you can avoid for 11 months straight and then in the 12th month you're going to come and read it in its totality. The odds are more than likely you're not going to complete its recitation in the month of Ramadan. Yes, reading it in the month of Ramadan is the sunnah to complete a juz, to complete the Quran in the month of Ramadan is the sunnah. But most people can't do it because if you're not acquainted with the Qur'an on a consistent basis, it's going to be difficult. Allah said about the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, إِنَّا سَنُوْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا Ya Muhammad, we're going to reveal to you a statement, a book that is heavy. It's not light. It's not something you can just come and read it like that. Something you can avoid for 11 months and then come and complete it. لو انزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. If we reveal the Quran on a mountain, you would have seen the mountain rent asunder from the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. So everyone asks himself, the last time that I read the Quran consistently for three days straight, when was it? Yesterday was Friday. Whoever we sort to cast on Friday will have a light shining for him until the next Friday but the vast majority of people can't read for the Tukaf on Friday whether you're employed or not employed whether you have the time or you don't have any time people are disconnected from the Quran and Nasiha so the book of Allah is reading it so we have to make it our business Ikhwan, to make a bigger effort to be people who read the Quran you don't speak Arabic 
You struggle in reading the Quran, you still should pick up that Quran so that we don't come Yomu Qiyama and the statement of Allah concerning what the Prophet will say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yomu Qiyama, it won't be applicable to us. Allah Ta'ala said, what's going to happen? وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Yomu Qiyama, the messenger will say, Oh my Lord, my Ummah, they abandoned the Qur'an. They left it. They abandoned it. So now the question that may present itself is the person who says, Yeah, but what about the ayah that says, لَقَدْ يَسَّلَّ الْقُرْآنَ ذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ الذِّكْرِ We have made the Qur'an easy to memorize, easy to be remembered. So is there not someone who will memorize, who will remember? The Qur'an is easy, meaning if you made the Qur'an a perpetual companion of yours, you'll find you have the ability to memorize. You have the ability to read it with ease. But the one who puts it on the side and then he gets a musiba or muscular, something happens, his wife is about to have the baby and there's some complications, he goes to the Qur'an and he starts reading the Qur'an. Know Allah Ta'ala in the good times by having nasiha to his book and Allah will know you in the difficult times. Part of having nasiha to the book, one of the most important aspects of having nasiha to the kitab of Allah is causing the Qur'an to be a judge between you and me when we dispute. Between you and your wife when you dispute. Between you and your son-in-law, between you, you and your son-in-law, when there's a dispute. Not allow our desires to be the point of reference. يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِنَّا أَنْزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ لِتَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِنَا أَرَاقَ اللَّهِ Verily we reveal the book to you in truth, so that you can judge between the people with that book, and what Allah wants you to judge. The Muslim has a dispute, and right away he runs down to City Hall, the City Hall of the Kufar, and he says to his Muslim brother, between you and me is the Kafir judge. The brother divorces the wife three times, it's the third divorce, they have no children. She takes him to court to steal half of this property. Having the fiha to the Book of Allah is allowing the Qur'an to be the judge between you and those who you dispute with. We are living in a strange time right now because we have Muslims who claim to be upon the Sunnah, who want to be upon the Sunnah. The thing that is serving as the marja, what serves as the point of reference, is the opinion of one human being or two or three, other than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is that? What religion is that? We're free of that, and I don't care what you call it. Salafia or other than that. Free of that. Nonsense. The Book of Allah is our point of reference. But the Book of Allah, according to your understanding, my understanding, his hers, according to the understanding of what Allah wants, as the ayah said, لِتَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِمَا أَرَاكَ Allah That you may judge between the people and what Allah wants. You understand the Qur'an the way Allah wants, the way the Prophet understood it, and the way he wanted it to be understood, and the way he explained it, and the way those people who were with him understood it when it was given to them, and it was revealed on them and because of them, رضي الله عنه. All of that, ikhwani, brothers and sisters, is al-nasiha to the kitab of Allah. It is for that sister who's a Muslim, and nasiha to the book of Allah, it is for her to know and to believe. If the ayah said, we have given degrees to the men over the women, she accepts that. If the Quran has allowed a man to have more than one wife, and he tries to do it properly, and he can do it properly, she may not necessarily like it or think it's best for her, but she says, I hear and I obey. That's just one of the many examples. And nasiha to the Book of Allah 
It means that we embrace every hukum that is in the Qur'an. Every hukum is just and every hukum has hikmah. وَالنَّسِيحَ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Nasiha to the Messenger of Allah has two meanings. The first meaning is, if you are living with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he seeks your nasiha, then you have to give him advice. In the battle of Badr, when they got the asara of Badr, they came and they took hold of the captives of Badr. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he used to always do, he said, Ya Aba Bakr, Mada Tara. What do you think we should do with these people, Ya, ya Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are our blood relatives, brothers, uncles, fathers, they are relatives. Plus, we need money. Let's ransom them. Send them back. It's Ihsan, it's Dawud Allah, and we'll preserve the blood of our relatives. Hikmah. Arham Ummati Abu Bakr. The one who has the most Rahmah of my Ummah is Abu Bakr. Oh, Umar, what about you? What do you think? What do you think we should do with them? Ya Rasulullah, they try to extinguish the light of our Islam. People who are enemies to our Islam, we have no wala for them. So, therefore, let's dig a hole, a big hole. You take your relative, give Abu Bakr his relative, I'll take my relative, we'll chop their heads off and throw them in a hole and bury them. That's what we do with the people who are enemies to Islam. This nonsense about all of the spokes of the wheel lead to the center. They try to extinguish the religion of Al-Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the position of Rahmah. And both of the positions were positions of Rahmah and positions of strength and positions of intelligence. The point is, Ikhwan, he took Nasiha. And Nasiha to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you are living with him, is to give him sincere advice. In the battle of Al-Ahzab, when all of the Arabs came together to extinguish the light of the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, he asked, what should we do, people, what should we do? Salman al-Faris, he said, Ya Rasulullah, in Persia, what we used to do, if a great force of came to get us, and we didn't think we had the ability to repel them or to deal with them, we would just dig a hole, a ditch, whoever jumped over the ditch will chop his head off, pulverize him, annihilate him. Rasulullah took the nasiha of Salman al-Farisi. In the Qisat al-Ifq, when they accused our mother Aisha radiallahu anha of making zina, Rasulullah, a human being, he doesn't know what should he do. He asks Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was a shaft from the Shabbat. He asks Usama ibn Zayd, who was a shaft from the Shabbat. What do you think I should do concerning the statement, what they said about Aisha? Ali radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, the women are many. You can marry any woman that you want. The Shiite comes and says, you see, this is the Dalil that the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abu Hassan, Abu Turaf, he had a problem with Aisha. Authentic Hadith said Bukhari. This is a Dalil. This is not a Dalil. Ali was saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, enter Raju. You are a man who has a lot of responsibilities. The Dawla, the Jihad, protection of the Muslims, spreading the deen, judging between the people, praying Islam, leading the pilgrims. You have a lot of responsibility. You have too many things to do to lose focus on a woman. Not like some of us. He can't do anything. He becomes dysfunctional because he gets a divorce. He can no longer think straight. He leaves the house in the morning. He has one shoe on and one shoe off. One sock is pink, the other sock is green. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being advised by Ali. لا يا رسول الله النساء كثيرات لا تنشغل you have an honor. You have something, other things more important. That's what he meant. Usama bin Uzayn said, Ya Rasulullah, 
We know nothing about your wife except good. That's the kalam of the evil ones. So the point is, Ikhwan, the youth gave him a nasiha. In the sikh of al Hudaybiyah, when they were going to make the jihad, they were going to make the umrah, kuffar prevented them from making umrah. So they decided Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was revealed, you won't make the umrah this year. He went back, everyone was in his ihram. He told the people, slaughter your animals and come out of your ihram. The companions refused, refused. See, this is a delil that the companions, they are not an example for us. They did not obey Rasulullah. So if you really want to disobey, what is this idea about the companions are the example? Ikhwani, they didn't disobey Rasulullah because they just wanted to be disobedient. No. They were saying, Ya Rasulullah, isn't the haq with us? We're ready to go and to open up Mecca with our ihram on despite these people and despite the fact that we didn't even come prepared for war. When you're making Umrah before al Islam, before Islam, the Arabs, if they went to Mecca to make Hajj or Umrah, they would not carry with them all of the weaponry of war. You only carry your sword. You don't carry your spear and your shield and everything going to get ready to get busy. No, it was against the respect of the Kaaba. So they were saying, we are ready to deal with those kufar. That's where they were coming from. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into the tent. Our mother, Umm Salima, saw him. Ya Rasulullah, what's the matter? I told the people to take the ihram off and they didn't do it. She said, you slaughter your animal, take your ihram off and you go out. They're going to follow suit. He did it. As soon as they saw him, they knew that he is the example. So they all slaughtered and took their clothes off, took the ihram off. So Ikhwan, the point from all of that is, he took advice from the elders, Abu Bakr and Umar, people who were similar to him in the community, in age. He also took advice from his wife. I'm the man. I'm the husband. I'm going to marry my daughter and I don't want to hear what you have to say. The men have the power. Yeah, Ikhwan, you can see what does your wife have to say about it. But ultimately, you have the last statement in most of the issues, in most of the affairs. But you seek the assistance and the opinion of your wife. You seek the assistance and the opinion of your teenage son, your teenage daughter. They're of the age of driving. So, you ask them, what do you think we should do? What kind of car should we get? If you make them a part of the choose, the choice and the process of choosing, then maybe they'll be more apt to take, to take care of the car when you allow them to drive it. They feel a responsibility towards it. Two points that we want to make about this though, very important critical points. Number one, the fact that he asks people for advice, it shows his humility. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wasn't beyond seeking advice. And number two, it shows he's a human being. As we mentioned, Allah it doesn't mean giving advice to Allah. If you think you can do that, that is kufr. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as some of our brothers believe, if he was created from the nur of Allah, he wouldn't be in need of asking people for nasiha. He's created from the nur of Allah. How does Allah's nur need to be advised? Allah is not in need of advice. It's a delirium. As Allah azza wa said in the Quran, quote, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشُرُ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ Say unto them, It has been revealed unto me that you are God, your Lord. There's only one God. He's one. I'm a human being like you people. And it was revealed to me that your God, your Lord is one. I moved to a community of Asians, and this is not to mess with the Asians. This is not to mess with the Asians or to pick on the Asians. People from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they have aspects of their culture which are positive and aspects of their culture which are negative. And this is not something that is peculiar to them. Africans, Arabs, the Muslims have this in general. Khurafat. 
There are feeders, the are feeders, hocus pocus, open sesame. I went and I was the new person in the community, African American. They were hearing there was a new imam here. African American is in our community. I went to the local butcher and I wanted to purchase some things from the butcher. The man asked me, hey, you're the new guy? Yeah, I'm the new one. Well, I want to ask you a question. You want to ask me a question to test me because you're a brewery and you know that I'm from Ahl al-Hadith? You want to ask me a question because you want to test me? He said, I'm serious. I want to ask you a serious question about the deen. What's the question? He, he put his hand on and said, what does my future hold? I don't say that for you to laugh. The man really believes like that, Ikhwani. There are people who believe that nonsense. You gave this much money to the peer, and he can explain to you and tell you what your hand is telling you is going to happen to you. What is that? Your soul was created from the noon of Allah. On the arsh is written, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Where does that kalam come from? You go into the homes of the Muslims, there is the poster, the 99 names of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from his names on the poster, Al-Awwal wal-Akhir, the first and the last. Al-Shafi, the one who cures. If you have that poster, you should rip it up and get rid of it. The Prophet did everything sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to establish a tawheed. To show us that he is not like Allah. He is not similar to Allah. In the ring that he took, the very ring that he took, he had written at the bottom, Muhammad in the middle, Rasul at the top, Allah. Muhammad Rasul Allah. He could have did it the other way, but it's not good etiquette. Muhammad at the top, Rasul in the middle, Allah at the bottom. That's not good etiquette. So now in the home, how do we have the two pictures? Allah here, Muhammad here. If you're going to have that, you have to put Muhammad down and never allow that to creep into the way you understand this religion. And you'll see her to the Messenger of Allah when he's living and he seeks advice from you because he's a man and he has blind spots. He doesn't know that the Jews are on top of the building, they're going to drop a boulder on his head unless Jibril came and told them. The second way that we have Nasiha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is if you're living after he has died. To have Nasiha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it relates to us is that we have ikhlas to his sunnah and we believe in his sunnah. And we learn about his sunnah, that the woman doesn't leave herself ignorant about the sunnah. We learn how our religion is telling us what to do. The Muslim eats with his right and he drinks with his left with his right. That's how the Messiah to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Loving the sunnah, calling to the sunnah. Being upon the sunnah, even if all of the people say, you're not from the sunnah. Even if they say, you're not from the sunnah, when it's between you and Allah, no one else is looking. It's just you and Allah. You know that you are upon the sunnah, and you want to be upon the sunnah. And you say, despite what those people are saying, this is my deen, this is my minhaj, to defend it, to call to it, to spread it. That's a nasiha. From the most important aspects of a nasiha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is just like the Qur'an causing the sunnah to be the judge between you and your disputing. Allah swore by himself, tabaraka wa ta'ala, and he said in the Qur'an, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَدِيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا Allah said, I swear by your Lord, they do not believe until they cause you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your sunnah to be the judge between them and that which they dispute about. 
and then they have no problem with what you have given the ruling to. Absolutely submit. Right now we're living in the time of ikhtilaf and then furqa, the time of people loving to be in charge. And as a result of wanting wealth and wanting position, no one is safe. At this time, giving the fiha to the sunnah is turning to the sunnah. Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati wa khulafa al-rashidun al-mahdiyin min ba'd. Whoever from amongst you lives for a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. You're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. Fa alaykum bi sunnati. Hold on to my sunnah. And his sunnah shows us and tells us that he is the most knowledgeable, that he is the one who is ma'asun, that he has the most taqwa, that every woman that comes from him is not from the hawa, never. When Du Khwaisira grabbed him and said, you didn't want the haq, you weren't just in this judgment, that's kufr. Every judgment of his was for the haq. But after him, we can't guarantee that for any human being by himself. He's the only one who's ma'asum. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A person, even though he may be broke, what I agree with is something is wrong with you and the way you think. Well, where's the delir for that? I don't need the, any delir. My body alone is enough for that. Not for me. I told my mother and my father, and I love my mother and my father more than I love any of you. I don't love their kufr, I don't love their kufr. My mother and my father gave birth to me, and I love them more than any of you. But in embracing Islam, in embracing Islam, I said to them in essence, not with my tongue, but the tongue of my condition said to them, hey, I'm not trying to go to the hellfire for you people. So do you think that when you come with something that's not making sense and it's against the delil, that I'm going to say, yeah, I agree with you because you're you? No, I'm not going to say that to you. I don't care who you are. So, and nasiha to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam ikhwan is causing him to be a judge between us. His sunnah to be a judge between us. Not Abu Hanifa. Not Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i, not Al-Imam Malik, nor Al-Imam Ahmed, not Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, or La Ibn Uthaymeen, or La Al Albani. Not them in their person or their personality. The Sunnah. Someone comes and says, but Al Albani said, but Sheikh Abdul Baz said, that's not enough. That is something that may cause me to help the scale go this way or that way. It has some benefit. And al said that. And Imam Ahmed said that. In the Janazah, you should raise your hand for every tabir. And Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak said that. And Imam Ahmed said that. That was the opinion of many of the great ulama of al Hadith. But there's no delay from the Sallallahu that said that. So, if those imams said that, wow, that's, that causes the scale to weigh down. And Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak, and Imam Ishaq ibn Ibrahim Rahula, Rahawi, he said that, those three, it makes the scale. But him by himself, kalla wallahi. And nasiha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah is the only human being who says something and we don't look to the right or the left. We take it and that's it. And then moving right along, and let's see how to be imams of the Muslims. Very important, Ikhwan. We don't have the problem of blowing innocent people up, making taqseer of people, claiming jihad is here and there. Except because of the ignorance of some of the people as it was relates to a nasiha to the leaders of the Muslims. And nasiha to the Muslim leaders is that we have ikhlas to them. That we make dua for them. Al Imam Ahmed said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, Lo kanat li da'wat mustajabatin la ja'altuha fil iman. 
If I had a dua that was accepted, I'd have made the dua for the iman. Because everyone is going to benefit. I make the dua for me and my kids, that's it. You guys are going to lose out. So every Muslim leader in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Pakistan, in Morocco, in Egypt, every Muslim leader, if he is a Muslim, we should make dua for that individual. And we don't make khuruj against that individual. We have nasiha. We hope the hearts of the people get united under his banner and under him. We don't usurp his leadership. And we give them advice. But giving the leader advice in al Islam, Ikhwan, it has its tariqah. There is a way of giving advice to the one who has position of leadership. The Prophet said in the authentic hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's being collected by Imam Ibn Abi Asim. And the Sheikh Nasir said it was an authentic hadith. In the chapter of how to give advice to the leader, calling Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man arada an yansaha lidi sultan, falya khudhu bi yajuhi, walya khlu bihi. فَإِنْ قَبِلَ فَبِهُ وَنِعْمَةٌ وَالْرَفَضَ فَقَدْ أَدَّمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ Whoever wants to advise the leader, then take him by his hand and seclude yourself with him and give him advice. If he accepts your advice, the ni'mah. If he rejects it, you gave what was upon you. That's how we advise the leader. There's a hadith that says, أَفْضَلُ الْجِهَادِ كَلِمَةُ الْحَاقِنَ إِمَامْ جَائِرِ The best you had is saying the truth to an oppressive leader. Yes, but there's no contradiction. That doesn't mean that you're in front of the people and you start saying the كَلِمَةُ الْحَاقْ You take him to the side. And he has the sword. He'll cause your head to roll down the street. And it's nobody's business. But you nonetheless say the حَاقْ behind closed doors. And Ikhwan, I don't know. It's because we have double standards in our religion. Every married man from amongst you is an imam. You are a leader in your home. You are the hakim. You are the qadi. Your home is your mahkama. It's your government. Your wife and your children, they are your subjects. You're the imam. Your wife can advise you any way she wants to advise you. Tomorrow, Sunday, inshallah, you're going to have a big lunch with your relatives. Your father's coming to lunch. Your uncles are coming to lunch. Your best friends are coming to lunch. Some of the people in the community are coming to lunch. Your wife, she loves your son, and she's a religious girl. Full niqab and hijab, everything. She knows that you gamble. She knows that you drink hummer. She knows that you're doing something haram in our side. So tomorrow she decides to come into the room where all of your guests are, and with ikhlas and sincerity she says, Ya Abdullah, Ya Habibi, Ittaqillah, and stop drinking khamar. We're going to say, what is this? We're going to say, sister, that's haram. What are you doing? Giving your husband the imam advice like that in front of his relatives. What, what is that? We're going to say, that's haram on you. She says, but I have ikhlas, but he's really doing evil. Naam, but whoever wants to abolish the imam, take him to the side. You're eating dinner, and the children are sitting around the table, and your wife starts to say, Taqillah, stop drinking khamar. Taqillah, stop, stop gambling our money away. In front of the children, it's haram. The Imam is advised in a particular way. Why? Because if you advise him other than that, Ikhwan is going to be more fit now. So that's our religion. They came to, as Imam al-Bukhari now, they came to Usama ibn Zayd, and they were getting on him. Ya Usama, Ya Usama, why don't you give nasiha to Uthman? Uthman's relative was drinking khamar and doing certain things. He wasn't doing the right thing, and he was a governor for Uthman. Why don't you talk to this man? Why don't you talk to this man? Meaning, let us see you advise him and get on him. Usama said, I do advise him. And what is between him and me? What? You just want to see me advise him? I don't want to open a door that was never opened before. I don't want to be the first one to start advising the man in front of the people. It wasn't from the way of 
the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a nasiha to the imams, ikhwan. This masjid right here, things we don't like about or whatever, something's wrong. We advise the people in a way where we are not causing the people to go against the administration. In any masjid you go to, something is going on, you go and you advise the people. They don't do this, they don't do that, this is that. You go and you advise the people. Then make more fitna and cause the division. Lastly, Khan, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Nasiha to the general Muslims. And Nasiha to the general Muslims, Khan. As I mentioned, a person may not know the reality. A person's fitra has been corrupted by the appearance. The girl grew up not wearing hijab because her culture told her to do that. Her environment, no one told her, your hair like this is nakedness. No one told her to feel shy about that. In general, she has hayat. In general, she has hayat. But she'll go out with her hair like that because her fitra has been corrupted. The man goes to marry his wife for the first time. It may be an arranged marriage or other than that. And he has Gira and he's on the day. So when they bring the girl to the brother and he's waiting outside to drive away, to go away with his wife, all of the people are witnessing this. He only saw the girl's face inside the house for a few minutes. And now he's outside after they ate, he's outside. They bring his wife out and her hair is out. He has Gira. Her hair is exposed to all of the people. His kufi starts to turn around like this. Because his wife is being shown in front of the people and his head is turning around. What is he going to do? Go off on her in front of... Nah. Leave it. The people over her, they corrupted her Mia and her fitra. Give her advice. The Prophet described us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Mu'min Mur'atul Mu'min. The believer is a mirror to his brother. He said, حق المسلم على المسلم ست وذكر منها إذا استنصحك فانصح له If he seeks advice from you, then give him good advice. That's the حق that we have over each other. To give and receive good advice. So, Ikhwan, with that being the case, we're going to bring this to an end. And I advise you, inshallah, myself, with a sabr على الحق. And a sabr on the aqdar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qadr of Allah. Because the deen of Allah is going to be ghalib. And ghulu is never successful. Never. You never do too much of anything except it's going to be a problem. Ghulu is a mushkila. Be patient. That's my nasiha to you. Bear patiently with the kalam of this one and that one. And I also advise you with the issue of what is extremely important, and that is, we have to come up with some more money concerning the fundraiser, Ikhwan. We don't get enough money to offset our expenses. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So, we want to ask you to please give generously if you didn't give, and if you did give, to give a little more just again, inshallah. Allah Akbar Allah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Can you wait for a minute till after the event?